All right, it was June 7th. You love my story? So I'm good, good. It was June 7th, 2009. And a few hundred media members squeeze into a small room with one light on that is facing an empty podium. The room is loud uh, because everyone's trying to verbally process everything that they just saw. But as loud as the room was, it suddenly becomes quiet because in walks the best player in the NBA at that time, three-time champion, Kobe Bryant, 31 years old, and he sits at the podium. And he sits at the podium right after scoring 29 points, team high 29 points in an overtime game of game two of the NBA Finals. And they had just won this game, they're up 2-0. They are the favorites in this series, they're going against Dwight Howard's Orlando Magic. The Lakers are the first seed, they're the clear cut favorites, they're up 2-0. I mean, they, they look like they've just taken a commanding lead over this series, and yet, as Kobe sits down and they're asking him questions in his classic, stoic, intense temperament, he goes in on these questions. And as he's answering these questions, he actually looks a little bit upset, almost as if it was his team that had lost the game. And so finally, one reporter speaks up and he asks what everyone in the room wants to know. And he, he asked Kobe this. He said, you know, we're still waiting for a big smile out of you. You're up 2-0. What's the story? Are you not happy? And Kobe responded, what's there to be happy about? And the reporter repeated, you're up 2-0. And Kobe's response to this question has become legendary, and it's actually the title of this message today. Because to, uh, in response to the reporter's question, Kobe said this. He said, job's not finished. Job finished? I don't think so. The Lakers would go on to win the series handily as Kobe and his team secured their four, actually he secured his fourth out of five NBA finals championships and the first of his two MVP honors. Now, if you're a Lakers fan, enjoy that because that's probably one of the few times I'll ever praise the Lakers in front of people. <laughs> Amen. All right. You know, uh, I'm excited to begin a, a summer sermon series today on the book of Judges that we're calling Conquests and Compromises. And so this will be a 10-week series taught by our teaching team that will give us different perspectives on the historical recounting of Israel going into the land that God promised them. All right, now why the book of Judges? Maybe you're asking that. Thanks for asking, let me tell you. All right. There's a lot of scholarship that equates the book of Joshua and its sequel, Judges, with the book of Acts. And what they say is that the first five books of the Old Testament are similar to the first four books of the New Testament. And that in the same way that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John lay out the plan of salvation and the book of Acts teaches us how to live in to that freedom, that the, the book of Joshua and Judges is about living into the freedom that God lays out to his chosen people of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The book of Judges tells us the story of Israel's conquest of Canaan after the death of Joshua. Canaan was this specific geographical area located on the eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea. And all throughout scripture, it is referred to as the promised land. That's how we know it, right? The promised land. God gave his people this land, but there was one problem with the land. You know what the one problem with the land was? There are already people living in it. All right. There's people living in the land already. And God's charge to Israel was to conquer the land by driving out and destroying those who are in it. Now, it's easy to get stuck on this idea of war in the name of God. And so I just want to speak to it briefly or else some of you may be distracted for the rest of this message. Right. Um, so this conquest was not about race or ethnicity. It was not about imperialistic expansion. It was a holy war. All right. God intended to use Israel as holy judgment against people who in their wickedness built deeply embedded cultures and ways of living around immorality, things like gross sexual immorality and exploitation, uh, things like child sacrifice, things like ruthless imperialism uh, that, that 
um, included things such as, but not limited to, plundering other nations and enslaving other nations. And even more than that, the people of this land built religious frameworks that tied their wicked practices uh, to gods they served and beliefs and hopes for individual and national flourishing. And so in the book of Joshua, Joshua leads an army of previously enslaved shepherds and farmers into war to take over that land. And when Joshua ruled, Israel was virtually unbeatable. I mean, they would go into uh, these lopsided battles with odds greatly against them, with tools that were inappropriate for the fight, and they wouldn't suffer a single casualty when they went into war. They wouldn't suffer a single casualty because God fought for them. Their obedience and their faith meant that every enemy fell before them. But as we enter into the book of Judges, Joshua has died and there's still a lot of land to conquer. But as their faith and obedience wavers, their compromises begin to frustrate their plans for conquest. And the only thing that can get them out of these long stints of idolatry and these long stints of enslavement are these judges who are like these post-Joshua deliverers and saviors that God would send as a, re a response to their repentance. So as it turns out, it was Israel's sin that was the true foe behind any enemy that they faced. All right, foreign nations weren't Israel's problem. Israel was her own problem. And so the further we read into the book of Judges, we're gonna see the deterioration of a nation. With each judge that's raised up, there's a national revival but the, the effectiveness of each revival wanes, and you're gonna see this as we go through. The effectiveness of each revival wanes as every judge that God sends, the more judges he sends, the more flawed they are. And, and it points to the failure of any human savior and our need for a true and ultimate savior. And so I've, I've heard uh, Tim Keller say this a ton of times as he talked about the book of, of Judges. I love it, I wanna share it with you. So he says in Othniel, which we're gonna look at Othniel next week, but in Othniel, we learn that God can save through all as when Othniel went out to war, all the tribes went with him. In Deborah, God can save through many because only some of the tribes went with Deborah. In Gideon, God can save through a few. If you know his story, only 300 went with Gideon. And in Samson, he can save through one. And ultimately, God will save by sending the one. And so in this summer of blockbuster superhero movies, movies like Guardian of the Galaxy and Spider-Man and Transformers and Mission Impossible and Flash, all these other, I just figured you guys would be in the swing of things here, okay? All right, so another thing I, I uh, think, one of the reasons why I think the book of Judges is helpful is because of where we are as a church. Uh, this September will be the one-year mark of our leadership change here at The Rock. Now, last September, there were many questions about whether this church, which has served this community for 25 years, would even be here by the end of the year. Uh, and so we were facing questions like, man, what, you know, who, who would lead us moving forward? Uh, would a change in leadership cause a mass exodus? Could we right the ship with the finances before it was too late? We were asking questions like, you know, if we're going to survive, what structural changes to the organization need to be made to set us up for long-term success, right? And so it's now almost a year later, and I just have to say, we've been met by and blessed by God's miraculous provision. Yeah. We have, we have, amen. And we'll, again, for those of you coming to the, the business meeting on Thursday, we'll be able to talk about that. Uh, but what we've done is we've installed one of our lead pastors. Um, we, as you saw today, we've installed our worship director, and we are very close to rounding out our full uh, elder uh, team. So we're really close to having that done. And so our church body has come together like a true family, and we've worked through difficult times to become stronger together. Um, the finances have stabilized, and we are on a healthy trajectory that we haven't experienced in years. Lastly, we've started to organizationally change to a culture of love and service and accountability of things that we've been working on. So a lot of prayer, a lot of hard work, a lot of difficult conversations and new ways of thinking have led us to this place. However, we're not done, right? We're not done. Again, like the tribes of Israel at the beginning of the book of Judges, they were promised a land to dwell in as God's people, but it was their job to go and conquer it, right? And so our directive is no different, right? And so to quote Kobe, Job's not finished. 
So in the fall, we endeavor to train, begin training our, our leaders uh, in a new discipleship framework that enables us to ensure that everyone in positions of influence at The Rock are emotionally and spiritually healthy and that they can produce what they're becoming. But before we get there, what we want to do is we want to take this summer. I feel like this is, this is an opportunity before we kind of step into really building what God is, is showing us to build. This, this summer that uh, we have before us, uh, we want to focus on some of the mistakes and pitfalls that led Israel into what some scholars have called their dark ages. All right. So the question is for us this summer, what happens when our compromises clash with our hopes for conquest? And what can we do to make certain that we victoriously obtain all that God has for us? Those are questions we want to answer. Now, the way that we traditionally communicate vision here at The Rock is from the pulpit, but the problem with that is that, and some of you guys know this, if you ever miss a Sunday message, God forbid, right? But if you ever miss a Sunday, like, you're not catching the vibe then. Like, you just kind of miss out on, like, stuff that we're, we're talking about. And we're doing so. What we want to do, along with dedicating the next 10 weeks to preaching through the book of Judges, there is 10 weeks of really good material. I promise you, keep coming back. But as long, uh, along with dedicating 10 weeks to preaching from this book, we're also launching a summer read with us campaign. All right. And so, as a church, what we want to do is we want to read through the book of Judges together. Now, if your heart just sunk in horror, <laughs> thinking that you have just been banned to a summer of boring reading, let me tell you. Judges is wildly entertaining, okay? Wildly entertaining. There's so much going on. You see angels of the Lord show up, right? You see heroes, villains, scandals, civil wars. I mean, if you like Game of Thrones and Breaking Bad, you're, you're going to do just fine. You'll do just fine. You'll like this. All right, so here's how this is going to work, all right, as I wrap up my, my intro here. here was, this is how it's going to work. So as you came here today, you were in your seat you should have found a flyer. And in that flyer, um, you can also find this on our website. So if you go to the rock.church, you can find this there as well. Uh, But you will find our reading schedule for the next 10 weeks. All right. And so on Wednesdays of every every week throughout the summer, there will be a short reflection video, a devotion that'll show up. So 10 10 amazing couples at our church have said yes to do this. They're going to to post uh, devotions for us. So on Wednesdays, you'll see a short reflection of the reading posted on our church YouTube channel, and it'll be linked to our website. Um, it'll be linked on all of our social media pages, and we'll also send you emails, so you should be able to get it. It's also on a QR code on that flyer that you got as well. So, and so our earnest prayer on behalf of the teaching team, the leadership team, um, is that by studying and reading this book together this summer, we avoid some of the failures and pitfalls that kept Israel from all that God had for them. We want our faith community to be, in the words of John Tyson, a living experiment in closing the gap between what God promises and what a church can experience. Amen? Amen. Are, you guys, are you guys coming along for the ride? Yeah. All right, so let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are here, that you are good. Lord, as we open your holy scriptures, illuminate. Lord, teach us, help us to see not just the things that happen historically, but, but show us how this applies to our lives even now. God, we thank you for all that you're doing in our lives, for what you're doing in the room right now. In Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. All right, so as we look at the first few chapters of the book of Judges, Uh, What I want to do is I want to show you Israel's failure. I want to show you three things. Israel's failure to finish the job God gave them. Number two, God's response to that failure. And number three, God's solution to fix the failure. All right? So Israel's failure to finish the job God gave them. God's uh, response to that failure. And number three, God's solution to fix the failure. All right, so first, Israel's failure. Now, the first two chapters of the book of Judges give us two introductions This book has two introductions. The first chapter gives us the perspective of the Israelites, and the second chapter gives us the perspective of God, right? Joshua at this point has died, but everyone knows the mission. Everyone knows the mission. Let me let you in on this, okay? So so two passages, two things that God has told the people of God. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 16 says this. says, in the cities 
of the nations the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. Do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow the detestable things they do in worshiping their gods, and you will sin against the Lord your God. All right, second passage is Joshua chapter one. Joshua chapter one, verse three through five. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the West. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. So in chapter one, Israel goes to war, but immediately we begin to see some trends, all right? We begin to see some things that are happening and we're gonna read through all this. So you guys gotta follow me on this, okay? So we're reading the Bible on this series, all right? So are you guys okay with that? Okay, all right. All right, so I want you guys to see this trend as we just read through some things. All, all Nine tribes we're gonna read about and, and there's something that I want you guys to see here. So starting in verse 19 of chapter one. The Lord was with the men of Judah. They took possession of the hill country, but they were unable to drive the people from the plains because they had chariots fitted with iron. Next one, verse 21. The Benjaminites, however, did not drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. To this day, the Jebusites live there with the Benjamites. Verse 22. Through 26, now the tribes of Joseph attacked Bethel and the Lord was with them. When they sent men to spy out Bethel, formerly called Luz, the spy saw a man coming out of the city and they said to him, show us how to get into the city and we'll, show, we'll see to it that you're treated well. So he showed them and they put the city to the sword, but spared the man and his whole family. Did God say to do that? No. He then went to the land of the Hittites where he built the city and called it Luz, which is its name to this day. Verse 27, 28, but Manasseh did not drive out the people of Beth Shan or Tanakh or Dor or Iblium or Megiddo and their surrounding settlements for the Canaanites were determined to live in that land. When Israel became strong, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, but never drove them out completely. Verse 29, nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer and the Canaanites continued to live there among them. Verse 30, neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites living in the Kitron and Naholo so that the Canaanites lived among them, but Zebulun did subject them to forced labor. You guys doing okay? Yep. Are you following this? Okay, verse 31 through 32. Nor did Asher drive out those living in Akko or Sidon or Athlab or Akzib whew, or Helba or Aphek or Rehob. The Asherites lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land because they did not drive them out. Verse 33, neither did Naphtali drive out those living in Beth Shemesh or Beth Anath, but the Naphtalites too lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land and those living in Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath became forced laborers for them. Last one, verse 34 and 35, the Amorites confined the Danites to the hill country not allowing them to come down into the plain. And the Amorites were determined also to hold out in Mount Harris, um, Ajalon and Shabum. But when the power of the tribes of Joseph increased, they too were forced or pressed into forced labor. So nine tribes mentioned, all nine took else. All nine couldn't fully conquer the, the land. So Israel does not finish the job that God gave them to do and their outlook on their attempts to take the land was we couldn't that was their outlook their outlook was we couldn't and so why couldn't they take the land let me tell you i think there's three reasons why they couldn't take the land the first reason why they couldn't take the land was it was too hard it was too hard their enemy was determined to hold out their enemy was determined to live in that land they were opportunistic they said, hey, you spare me. I'm just going to go and build another city like the one you overthrew, right? They also had chariots fitted with iron. Now, that's a reasonable reason, right? They had chariots fitted with iron. Like, you're not going to be able to fight against that. That would be reasonable if God didn't tell you that this was coming, 
Because Deuteronomy chapter 20, God says this to them ahead of time. He says to them, when you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, do not be afraid of them because the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt will be with you. God told them ahead of time, you will see horses and chariots. Don't run. They took possession of the hill country, but they were unable to drive out the people from the plains. The Danites were confined to the hill country. The Amorites wouldn't leave and let them come down to the plains. And so what does that mean? I believe that means that the hills were easy, but the valleys kicked their behinds. The hills were easy, but the valleys kicked their behinds, right? And this is a good picture of the Christian life, I believe, that the hills and the Christian life are easy, but the valleys are hard. Is that right? Some things become very easy when you make Jesus Lord of your life don't they? Some things become easy. There were some relationships that were really easy to cut off. There were some uh, things that were easy to stop doing. There were some places that were easy to stop going. You guys remember that? Right? But then God begins to put his finger on some other areas of our lives. And we quickly learn that, man, without God's help, we have no shot of overcoming these things, right? See, some of you, learning how not to curse is like learning to write in cursive, right? Uh, For some of you, you you never realized how hard it was to stop gossiping and slandering other people. For for some of you, you thought, man, I'm, I'm a shrewd business person, but after Christ, you learn, no, I'm just engaging in unjust and ungodly business practices, right? For some of you, you never knew how hard it would be to not violate your relationship with the opposite sex. You know, when I um, first became a believer, I had an encounter with Jesus at age 19. And I distinctly remember this because I was, I was trying to, so my girlfriend, who's my wife now, Amy, she didn't like it when I cursed. So I was trying to not curse. And then I encountered Jesus and he completely took cursing out of my mouth. Compl- I mean, it was gone, guys. I was shocked, gone. Not only that, but my desire for my ungodly music went away. My desire for dance clubs went away. I mean, all of it immediately, right away, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, like gone, went away. And so I started walking around thinking, man, I, Christian life, man, this is <laughs> not, no big deal. But boy, did I not have any idea about what lust was doing in my heart. It was kicking my behind. Matter of fact, I, and I just told uh, Nick and Stephanie Carbajal about this this week. As a 19-year-old freshly saved, walking around Sac State campus from class to class, I had to walk around with my head down looking at my shoes because I had never trained my eyes not to look at the wrong places on women. I literally did not have control over my eyes and I had to teach myself afresh how to use my eyes, Right? This is how this works, right? And so God has called us to take over land and the hills and the valleys of our lives. So if your valleys are kicking your behind, then maybe what God is telling you to do is too hard and you need to go to him for help. Amen. Maybe, just maybe. They couldn't take the land because it was too hard, but they also couldn't take the land because it was too harsh. All right, so not only was it too hard, it was too harsh. And so to God, maybe they said, destroy them, God, Drive them out? That's a bit much. God, God, how about this? God, I have an idea. We have an idea. How about we just make them slaves and they can still live here? How about we do that? Kind of like as both ours, okay? How, how about we do it that way? We'll just, we'll just let them stay, but we'll just, we'll put them to work. How about that? Think about where Israel came from, right? Not just the spiritual distance traveled, but the geographical distance traveled. Their distant relatives that were slaves in Egypt couldn't have dreamed of the life that they were now living. Their great-grandparents who wandered in the wilderness could only see this land from afar, but now they're living in it. And so for them, for these these people living in the land, these, these Israelites, for them, yeah, they still had problems to solve. They still had enemies and camped all around them. They they had all this stuff going on, uh, but their life was better than their childhood. Maybe they thought that. Right? So sometimes the biggest threat to being great, guys, is being good. 
right? Worth to Jim Collins. Right? Just because your life is better than you thought it would be, or better than your parents' life, or better than your grandparents' life, doesn't mean that God doesn't have more for you. Right? So don't focus too much on your spiritual distance traveled, or you will settle for less than God's best for you. Right? Professional uh, UFC fighters, they talk about this issue all the time. Um, the big issue that they see is they say that there, there's a difference between fighters when they first begin building their career and fighters after they win the bag. Right after they win a prize, after they get some fame, they become champions, and this is what they say. They say that the fighters come in and they're hungry at first, they're scrappy at first, right? But then after some success, after some fame, this is what they say. They say it's hard to train when you're sleeping on silk sheets, <laughs> right? It's the subtle settle. It's the subtle settle, guys. Right? And so if you find yourself settling for less than God's best for you, and you think it's too harsh to make war with some of your pesky private sins, I would suggest to you, like Israel, you are underestimating your enemy. And so they couldn't take the land because it was too hard. They couldn't take over the land because it was too harsh. And they also couldn't take the land because it required too much heart. It required too much heart. See, Israel's biggest enemy was not the Canaanites or the Perizzites, Jebusites, or the people of this land. No, Israel's biggest enemy was Israel. It was Israel. God said, go with the power that I will provide and I will be with you. You only need believe and obey, and they couldn't do it. They, they didn't have the heart for it. And so we're gonna, we're gonna hear a lot about the rebellion of Israel in this book. And so I think it's important for me to redefine rebellion for us today. I think it'd be helpful to redefine in our minds. Because I think for many of us, when we think about rebellion, we think a lot about doing the worst things, don't we? We think about the worst things. Maybe you think that rebellion is about being completely reckless and destructive and explosive, and it is those things. Uh, maybe you think uh, rebellion is about blowing up your life and everyone else's life around you. But I wanna give you a definite, God's definition of rebellion. And we find this in the book of Judges as we read it. All right, so God's definition of rebellion, according to the book of Judges, is rebellion is disbelief and disobedience. Let me bring it down to earth for us. It's not just, you know, the people that don't come through these doors. This is our issue, disbelief and disobedience. Martin Luther said it this way. He said, every sin springs from a wicked heart of unbelief. You are your biggest sin problem. Any unbelief that remains in your heart is a spiritual danger to you. And so you and I, we ought to see different areas of our hearts as land occupied by idolatrous, wicked pagans that must be conquered with God's help. That's how we have to see our hearts, right? And so if you're going to do all that God's called you to do, you need to have a healthy and whole heart that can believe and obey God's voice. Amen. Tim Keller, in his study on Judges, he said this about Israel. He said, the people's failure to take all of Canaan both resulted from and represented their failure to give God exclusive lordship over their whole lives. The greatest danger, because it is such a subtle temptation which enables us to continue as church members and feel that nothing is wrong, is not that we become atheists, but that we ask God to coexist with idols in our hearts. So that's Israel's failure, all right? But what was God's response? All right, what was God's view of this? All right, chapter two gives us God's assessment of Israel's progress, and it says this. It starts off by saying, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, so let's just stop there for a second. Gilgal, Gilgal. Why did he come up from Gilgal? What happened in Gilgal? If you've read the book of Joshua, then you will remember that it was in Gilgal where God made a covenant with Israel as they came out of the wilderness and were on the precipice of going into the promised land. God makes a covenant with them there. Uh, and last year, early last year, um, we did a series where we preached through a lot of the book of, uh, of Joshua. And I just remember getting wrecked by Joshua chapter five because after God made a covenant with Israel, at Gilgal, Joshua then ventured forward. He began to scout out Jericho. And as he went to scout out Jericho, 
he encountered the angel of the Lord who had his sword drawn. And when Joshua approached the angel of the Lord, who he didn't know who he was in the moment, he approached him and he said, who are you with? And basically what Joshua was saying is, who are you fighting for? Are you, are you with Israel? Are you fighting with Israel? Or are you fighting with Canaan? And in one word, this commander of the Lord's army shattered all of Joshua's perceptions and categories because he said to Joshua, neither. In essence, the angel of the Lord was saying, listen, I don't take sides. I fight for the Lord. People take sides for or against me. And that changed Joshua at that time because before any war was fought or any land was taken, Joshua learned that Israel is not the prize, that, that the glory of God is the prize. The whole reason why God is giving them this land is not so that Israel can think of themselves as great, it's so that the whole world could know that God is great. And so he goes on to say in Judges chapter two, verse one and two, he says, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land I swore to give your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? So God says to them, I've told you to take this land. I've given you specific directions and you have disobeyed me. And so it's very important for us to see that Israel's outlook on their military campaign, their outlook was that they couldn't take the land, but God's outlook on their military campaign was that, no, out of your disobedience, you wouldn't take the land. And so looking at ourselves, the question is, are there areas in your life where you would say, I, I can't do something, but God would say, no, 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 out of your disobedience, you won't. Is there any area of your life like that? See, there's a big difference between can't and won't. If I can just say this, too often, we use our can'ts as a cover for our rebellious won'ts. More than calling out their disobedience, though, you see God wrestling with a deeper issue here. Uh, Michael Wilcock, is a, he's a minister uh, and an author, and he wrote a commentary in the book of Judges that helps us draw out the tension of this moment. Um, and, and he says that the passage should be read like this, okay? So Judges chapter two, one through two, should be read like this for you to really understand what's going on in the heart of God. I said, I would never break my covenant. And I also said, if you compromise with these nations, I will not drive them out. It is as if the Lord is saying, I have sworn to give you the whole of this land, yet I've also sworn not to give it to a disobedient people. You've put me in an impossible situation. I have sworn to bless you as my beloved people, and I've sworn not to bless you as a disobedient people. How am I to solve this dilemma? See, this right here is the irresolvable tension that we will see all throughout this book as we study it. Israel is in one way blessed by the presence and the favor of God, but they also limit God because of their disobedience. All right. I have to say, this... <laughs> This is what many Christians look like, right? This is what many of us look like. We are both miracles and messes at the same time, aren't we? <laughs> Bunch of messy miracles. Yeah, I heard a baby say yes. That's even better. <laughs> so chapter two goes on to show us the cycle that will repeat itself over and over again as we continue to read on. And so I wanna read this whole passage to you because as we continue on in the book of Judges, we're gonna see this happen over and over and over again, all right? So I wanna read this whole passage. So uh, Judges 2, 11 through 19. I can put it up. Then the Israelites did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshiped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. And his anger uh, against Israel, the, in his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them just as he had sworn to them, they were in great distress." 
And the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshiped them. They quickly turned from the ways of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to the ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and their stubborn ways. All right, so here's the cycle that we're gonna see repeat itself over and over again in this book this summer. The cycle is this. The cycle is disbelief that leads to disobedience, that leads to judgment and enslavement, that leads to uh, eventual repentance in the Israelites, that leads to God raising up a deliverer, a judge for them, and then the judge dies and they start the cycle all over again. All right, we're gonna see this happen over and over again, amen. And so like Israel, as I wind down here, it is, our t- it is our job to conquer the Canaanite territories of our hearts. You may have come a long way and you may have taken a lot of ground in your own life, but the job's not finished, right? Your biggest enemy is you. Your biggest enemy is you. The fight of our lives is to push back against disbelief and disobedience, but it's a fight that we can't win unless we know where the real power comes from. You have to know where the real power comes from. The power comes from the cross of Jesus Christ. That's where we get the power. The cross is where the irresolvable tension is resolved so that we are able to live a forgiven, obedient life, even despite living at times a disobedient, sinful life. And I'm so excited to share this with you guys. As we read through the book of Judges, as we look at these judges, you are going to see through either their, their story or through their actions, you're gonna be able to see Jesus. So I'm so excited to show you guys Jesus. Next week, you know, you guys have to deal with me again. I'll be up here. But next week, we're gonna talk about Othniel and Ehud. And I'm just, you guys are gonna be fascinated by what we see um, in, in their story. But because of sin, Israel was not able to finish the job that God gave them to do, and neither can we. But on the cross, Jesus dealt a blow to sin. He went toe-to-toe with sin. And as he hung there, he was able to say what Israel couldn't say. Because his last words before he died on the cross, he said three things. It is finished. It was there that our sin was imputed to him, was charged to his account, and that his righteousness was imputed to us, it was credited to ours. And so Jesus is the ultimate judge. He's the ultimate deliverer. He's the ultimate savior. He's the ultimate guardian of the galaxy. The ultimate transformer of hearts. The fulfiller of the most impossible of missions. Jesus is the ultimate champion. He's our eternal MVP. Jesus is the greatest of all time. He is the goat. Why? Because for us, he became a slaughtered lamb. Amen.